describe who he is or what he is to you how do you describe him how do you define him if you were to speak words that define or describe him this morning what would be the words you would use what would you be saying to him we heard a word in a song today it calls him it means a total deliverer a complete deliverer somebody may say savior the one who moves mountains my god is mighty to save someone may call him el shaddai the breasted one the mighty one someone may say he is my provider he's my helper in the time of trouble he is my crown he is my you to you alone belongs all glory and all praise and all adoration we we'll say to you this day Imela, you're the great and mighty king and we thank you you alone are worthy of all our praise can we clap and appreciate this mighty god this morning he is worthy of our praise is worthy hallelujah thank you judah you may be seated god bless you everyone can be seated in the house this morning and words cannot describe him words fail you he understands the hidden language in your size. Hidden expression in your groan. Sometimes all you can do is mm. it's like a woman in pain who can't articulate her words right. But every groan speaks volumes and has content. Good morning, church. It's good to see you again today. And to know that all is well with you. Whether it looks well or not, all is well. Amen. Because that's the language of faith. That we've got to call the things that be not as though they were. 
you must always remember the story or the foundation of all is well that we often state was a woman who had received a son because she was gracious to a prophet uh, shared on it some time back she perceived that Elisha was a prophet of God and she said to her husband this man needs a place to rest let's build a chamber some place for him so that he can um, dwell there and then Elisha began to ask is, does this woman have a need the woman said, I dwell in the midst of my own people. I'm content. I'm blessed. But she didn't have a child. So Gehazi said, she doesn't have a child. And he gave her the word of the Lord and she had a child. And then the child died. And in the midst of that, when she was going to encounter the prophet, is it well with you? She said, it is well. And the child was dead at home. But eventually that child would rise because of the words of faith that she spoke. If you speak life to every dead situation around you, it will come back to life. It's just a matter of time. If words created the whole of the universe, then it means that words still will sustain the universe. Upholding all things by the word of his power. That's what the Bible says about Jesus. This morning... We're going to be celebrating communion. I want you to turn to your neighbor. Should I ask you to do this? And gently pull their ear. I said gently. If your neighbor does not look like he wants... If former, you are, you are over pulling his ears. I said gently. And say, listen. You see, there are some ears you can't pull. <laughs> when you see your father. <laughs> you know, if, 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 let, let me demonstrate this. If, if, you're told to pull your ear, your, you know, your neighbor's ear, and is your father, this is what you do. <laughs> you just act as if you are touching something. <laughs> you hold it by faith. Okay, so say to your neighbor, neighbor, neighbor. hear the word of the Lord today. Because God will establish you as an overcomer. You're already one but you need to be established as one. Amen. And you don't even know the direction I'm coming from. Trust me, you don't. Revelation chapter 12. Let's read from verse 7. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. And so the great dragon was cast out that serpent of old called the devil and satan who deceives the whole world he was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him then i heard a loud voice saying in heaven now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our god and the power of his christ have come for the act accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb 
and by the word of their testimony and they did not love their lives to the death. I said a couple of weeks ago that it is not scriptural for believers to plead the blood. There is nowhere in the scripture, even though it has become common practice, that for everything and for every incident, for every trip you have to make, you plead the blood on the road. You plead the blood on your meat pie before you eat it. You plead the blood in, on your shoes before you wear it. It has become a culture and a practice that has no foundation in scripture. And that's common with the present day church. Somebody just initiates something. And whether it's within scripture or not, we just run with it. It becomes a culture. And somebody would say, even the Bible says, plead the blood. The question is where? And in most cases, this is the scripture that most people refer to. We overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. When you quote that scripture, you would assume that the Bible is saying it is okay to constantly plead the blood. But the reference to this scripture that births understanding is the preceding verse. Because in the preceding verse, Satan is introduced by a title. And that title is the accuser of the brethren. And the response to the accusations of the enemy against the believer is the blood, not by pleading it but by what the blood did 2,000 years ago on the cross of Calvary that made Paul write in Romans chapter 8 and I think it's verse 33 who shall lay any charge to God's elect well here is where rubber meets the road. As we break bread today, I believe that God wants us to break the bread of love and sincerity and honesty. Many times when we gather together to break bread, we break as it were, and I'm using this metaphorically from the context of scripture, we do not break on living bread, we break living bread. And I'm not talking about the physical bread. The unleavened bread within the context of scripture is bread that has not been leavened by yeast, that is not blown out of proportion by certain additives to it. So when the Bible speaks of unleavened bread, it's talking about bread that is not infiltrated by strains of sin and uh, accusations and bite, backbitings and slander. One of the reasons why many people do not overcome in their lives according to this scripture is that even though Satan is called the accuser of the brethren, they have taken over that ministry from Satan. So Satan no longer needs to be the accuser of the brethren. You yourself have received a ministry from him. It's called the ministry of accusation. Therefore, you fail in overcoming in your life because the platform God established for overcoming 
is for the accuser of the brethren. The blood enables you to overcome the accuser of the brethren. And once you take on the ministry of accusation, you can no longer benefit from the overcoming power that there is in the blood. This is an unusual message that I'm preaching today. It will wound, it will break, but it will make you whole. So ask your neighbor, which ministry are you fulfilling? When someone says, I've been called into ministry, you need to find out which one. Are you with me? I was thinking this morning, because I'm going to be ministering at a worship event, and I was just, my mind was just going on on what I was going to share until the Holy Spirit began to show me that one of the major hindrances to worship and true worship is accusation. Because if a man stands to lift up holy hands to the Lord, and he begins to hear words of accusation, from the enemy or words that have been spoken against him by satan and those who take on the ministry of satan his hands will eventually come down as he begins to feel unworthy if you look at john chapter 4 that was the issue with the woman at the well she had had five husbands that's enough to violate her understanding of worship. And I'm sure that every time she went out, eyes were upon her. She became or had become talk of the town. Fingers would keep pointing and saying, do you know that woman from Samaria? Five marriages. Borrowing the words of Pastor Simeon Afolabi, he said, they've carried wine for her five times. <laughs> and that's a stigma that not many people can handle. Now she's moved out of five marriages. She found a guy, she's determined not to marry him, and they are living in together. Living arrangement. Then she meets, and this is what baffles me about God. She meets Jesus at the well. And he made no reference to her five wrecked marriages, but began to point her to a certain future. Is it that he did not know that she had had five bad marriages? He knew, but that was not the issue. Because the issue with many people is not what they've done. The issue are unresolved things on the inside of them. Uh, that if God can address, every crooked man would walk straight. You walk straight. Give me to drink was the conversation he had with her. How can you be a Jew? Ask me to drink. Don't you know there's racial discrimination between the Jews and the Samaritans? Jesus said, if you know who is speaking to you and asking you to drink, uh, you will respond to him because I will give you to drink water that you would drink and you never thirst again. She said, wow, you mean I won't need to come to this well again? I think she was thinking it was going to build a well in her own compound. Did you get what I'm saying? Because what water would you drink that you never need to drink natural water again? And for that woman, oh, that must have been strong because if I don't have to leave my house, then I wouldn't have to see people pointing fingers at me. When he wanted to hit the nail on the head, he asked a question. Where's your husband? If it were Pharisees of today, the question would have been, you have been married five times? That man you are living with is not your husband? 
pack your things from his house and move out. Thank you. Go to your first husband. Because that's the original one you married. So, she, you know, she would, she would have to jump several to go to the first. Uh, but he said, where's your husband? And the woman said, I have no husband. Um, and he said to her, truly you have no husband. You have had five. And you don't, the man you are living with now is not your husband. And that was where he ended that discussion. He didn't condemn her. But you know what happened? She brought an entire city to Jesus. And trust me, without being told what to do, she must have gone to meet that man she was living with to say, Oga, is over. I've met the perfect man. He's called Messiah. Are you still here? Let me define some words for you. And then we'll begin to get deeper in this. Accuse. What does it mean from where we get accusation? To accuse means to charge with or declare to have committed a crime or to find fault to blame. That's what accuse means. To charge with or declare to have committed a crime to find fault to blame. In Job chapter 1 and verse 6, we're all acquainted with the accusation of Satan or by Satan against Job. The sons of God gathered before God and Satan himself came. And God asked the question, have you considered my servant Job? Satan said, yeah, yeah, man. Now, I know it's not like that in scripture. And that's why we're saying, why won't he serve you? The only reason he's serving you, I, if I paraphrase, I know him all. I walk around him. I see him. I know him very well. The only reason he's serving you is because there's an hedge. If you remove that hedge of protection, he will not serve you. Accusation. God said, okay, go. I know who I'm talking about. The hedge was removed. Job was hit. And he began to have all kinds of disaster around him. And then again, Satan came back and said, hey, look. Um, well, my, God said, my servant is still standing. He said, skin for skin. Let's, let's go down to basics. And see whether this man would not curse you. And boys and all kinds of things came and attacked Job. In the midst of all of that, Job did not sin against God. Now you would think that that's where the end or accusation ended. Then comes Job's famous friends. Who came to his house. And when they saw him in, their, in his state none of them could speak a word for many days. You know, there's certain situations you, you see that to speak would violate the atmosphere of that environment or even violate that person. None of them could say a word. But when they began to speak, instead of words of encouragement, they brought words of accusation against Job. Look, you must have done something. If not, God cannot be punishing you like this. Have you ever had people tell you that? And it may sound like they're trying to restore you. But they're actually helping Satan fulfill his ministry by saying, this thing is not ordinary. Go and check your life. Uh, see what you've done and let me tell you the danger with that if you check your life at any time there are things in your life that satan will point you to even though they have been dealt with by the blood he will say remember this that's why you are suffering this that's one of the reasons why the typology of lot is instructive 
when his wife was living uh, together with him and the family, the angel said, don't look back. I know that we learn in retrospect and history can be beneficial to us, but there are certain uh, parts of your life that Satan would want you to look back at and every time you look back and see it it will bring his accusation back afresh into your life do we really believe that the past is history That every sinner has a future and every saint has a past. But do we really believe that Jesus dealt with that past? Hello. Let's look at Job. Chapter 16 and verse 4. There's no part two to this message. We'll finish it today. But I'm telling you, it would do you so much good. It would do us so much good as a church. It would change your perspective in ways that will make you so whole and reposition you as an overcomer in life. Job chapter 16 and verse 4. This is Job's response to his friends. I also could speak as you do. If your soul were in my soul's place, I could heap up words against you and shake my head at you. But I would strengthen you with my mouth and the comfort of my lips will relieve your grief. When they brought accusations against him, he said, I can also talk like you. I mean, everybody can talk. Are you getting what I'm saying? If it's to talk, I can talk. But in spite of your accusations, I choose not. If your soul were in my soul's place, I could heap up words against you and shake my head at you. Job, you're a mess. But he said, I would rather strengthen you with my mouth. Turn to your neighbor and say, I choose to strengthen you with my mouth. Instead of to accuse you with my mouth. Do you know it's the same mouth you used to accuse that you can also use to strengthen? Same. And the comfort of my lips would do what? Just by my words and the comfort of my lips, I will relieve your grief. But I speak and my own grief is not relieved. <laughs> Let's leave that. In Matthew chapter 12 and verse 24, let me show you some things here. So you can change your ministry. Don't your neighbor, he's not talking about you. I'll say again, he may be talking about you. Matthew twelve twenty four. Let's read from verse 20. A bruised reed he will not break. A smoking flax he will not quench till he sends forth justice to victory. And in his name Gentiles will trust. Then one was brought to him who was demon possessed, blind and mute, and he healed him so that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. And all the multitudes were amazed and said, could this be the son of David? You can pause there a minute. Because we've heard that the son of David would come empowered by the Holy Spirit to do mighty things. Could this be the son of David? You would think the response would be, yes, we think so. But look at verse 24. 
And when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. They overlooked the good. Can, can you see how people are? A man is healed and is giving God praise. Won't you be thankful? Oh no. Satan would work through the minds of the Pharisees to even discredit the person of Jesus. Say, nah, 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 nah. This is not the Holy Ghost. This is the prince or the ruler of demons. We know his name. Beelzebub. And Jesus responded and said, knowing their thoughts, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation and every city or house divided itself against itself will not stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he's divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? Genesis chapter 49 and verse 22. Joseph is a fruitful bow. This is Jacob speaking concerning his sons. A fruitful bow by a well. His branches run over the wall. The archers have grievously or bitterly grieved him. They shot at him and hated him. But his bow remained in strength and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty god of jacob from there is the shepherd the stone of israel now let me ask you a question here it's speaking about joseph jacob says prophetically the archers wounded him the question is who are the archers let's let's ask who is an archer An archer is not, thank you. An archer is not just someone who shoots an arrow. An archer is a professional, thank you. He's a sniper. That's modern day terminology. A sniper does not miss his target. A sniper is deliberate. A sniper is intentional. A sniper is focused. A sniper marks its target or his target and a sniper never misses. We read about the great side of Joseph and how he became Grand Vizier or Prime Minister in Egypt. But when you bring this dimension to it, the archers shot at him. Who were the archers? his brothers. You can name them one after the other. That's one. Potiphar's wife was another awesome skilled archer. Now, let's start with the brothers. And they were touching something on Potiphar's wife. His own kin targeted at him, fired at him, and they got him. When the Bible would write later about the encounter between the brothers of Joseph and Joseph. It was Reuben who said, this young man, our brother, he pleaded for help with groanings and anguish of soul. Spare me. Save me. Deliver me. I've done nothing. I only had a dream. And he said, even in spite of his bitter anguish of soul, 
we still sold him off as a slave. His own brothers. Now you would say that is wicked. But ask your neighbor, how many people have you shot your arrows at in your lifetime? And you didn't miss. No, you didn't ask. I said, ask your neighbor. You, you just, you're just nodding your head. But his bow remains strong. Because of his trust in the mighty shepherd of Israel that even though they wounded him he would not die from those wounds let's look at another skilled archer Potiphar's wife when her husband returned she had Joseph's coat Not Gabriel's go to. <laughs> when Joseph was running away, she seized his garment and she held the coat there until Potiphar came back. When Potiphar returned, all she had to do was say, See the evidence. Joseph, how did Potiphar, how did your coat end up? Uh, I, I was, you see, uh, uh, as in, we were, you know, uh, I can explain, but I don't know how I was cleaning. She If you were there to judge, is it your lawyer? Evidence is critical in any legal proceeding. Here, Joseph is standing before the judge. Is this your coat? Uh, you see, uh, as in, we were, uh, is yes or no? Is this your coat? It's like, it is yes. Case closed. So he is left to his God alone who judges righteously. There's a story I cannot forget. Sometimes we need to go back to teach some of the things we've taught before. When I was young in faith, I read all of Kenneth Hagin's books, every single one. I still go back to read some of his books. I've read the one on marriage, divorce, and remarriage, and read that about some months back. Took the book and devoured all of it in one night. Needed to refresh myself of some things. He shared an interesting story that is very instructive. Very instructive. There's a man in a city that's mightily used by God. 
One day this man was in a difficult situation. His wife had been depriving him of intimacy. So he decided that he was going to go to a brothel and sleep with a prostitute. He drove to the place, got out of the car. And he was, as he was entering into this part of the city that was known as the red light district where brothels were, a member of the church saw him going into that community or the, that settlement where brothels were. And as that one saw him, went to town and said, I saw brother so-and-so go into a brothel to sleep with prostitutes. But what that brother did not see was that as the man was going in, the conviction of the Holy Spirit came on him and he went back. So, did he intend to go there? Yes. Did he change his mind somewhere along the way? Yes. The one who saw him go in, assumed that he went and finished his job, did not see him return. And that one had gone to town with the news. So now, who do you tell? Or who does he tell? That even though he went there, he came out. It would take God to vindicate him. Can never forget that story. Let me share another story my father-in-law shared. A very important man of great reputation in a little village where men and women were expected to you know, um, act decently at all times was wearing his traditional outfit in northern Nigeria and his Tumazaki, that's what it's called, isn't it? Tumanzigi. That's the trouser, right? Uh -huh. What do you call it? Sumanzigi. Uh, okay. What? Tumanzaki, thank you. Best man, take your time. Me, this is... This is Birom. You are. <laughs> so the, the rope was loose, and the man stood by the road to adjust the rope. Someone saw him and went all over town saying, This man you say is honorable, we saw him urinating on the street. So the king called him and said, you're, you're a respectable man in this city. How come you're urinating on the street? And he said, sir, I wasn't. The rope to my trouser was loose and I decided to just adjust it. The question then is, how many people will you go and tell that he was not urinating, but he was just adjusting the rope in his trousers? Does he go from house to house? Only God can vindicate him. Can we go home now? If you've never learned any lesson in life, these are two valuable lessons you must never forget. The fault finder spirit, there is something called the fault finder spirit. The fault finder spirit has an assignment to assault relationships at all levels. 
The fault finding spirit attacks families, attacks relationships between people, and attacks churches bringing division. You know, <laughs> many times the fault finder spirit masquerades itself as discernment. It manifests itself as the spirit of discernment and the spirit of revelation. We better do something about this now. If not, there will be trouble. And yet, you think that's discernment and restoration, but it's actually a fault finder spirit that just finds fault in everything. Let me share a third story with you, very real and down to earth. I share two stories. I got saved February 8th, 1987. It was a Sunday. Six days later was a Saturday, February 14th, 1987. A dear friend of mine, a lady, had a sister and were on campus together. Her sister was not saved. She had issues. Now, her sister, who's my friend, was trusting God that on this crusade ground, her sister, who was there, would get saved. And in the midst of all that emotion, she was crying she was praying, then it turned to tears. Now, I'd just been saved six days. So here she is. What did I, I didn't know there were Pharisees in the kingdom. I didn't know there were false brethren. I didn't know that there were people who had the ministry of Satan, the ministry of accusation. So the most natural thing to do when you find somebody crying is what? You console the person. Now, so there was, there, there was a crusade ground where people were sitting and I was 10 meters away where people were sitting and I just went, I didn't know that they don't hug on crusade ground. I didn't know they don't kiss the bride in some weddings too. Sometimes, you, you, you know, uh, uh, some <laughs> things are changing in the body of Christ. There are times you go into church and all the men will sit on the left and all the women will sit on the right and the reason, oh, they still do it. And the reason they do it where you're coming from, <laughs> okay, they've changed. The reason they do that is that so that brothers will remain focused and same. In the presence of God, you don't touch a sister so that you will not sin. <laughs> Let your eyes not behold iniquity. If he does not behold it in church, he will behold it outside. In an equa church in Kaguru. A young man and a young woman were getting married. And the pastor said, you may now kiss the bride. Kissed. An old man sat down and said, up. Uh, Abandasuna <laughs> Ida. Do you understand what I mean? It's like, uh, what they have been doing before. <laughs> Pastor, let me ask you Did you kiss your wife before you married her? Ah, you did not deeper life not allowed God bless you Joe did you kiss your wife before you were not in deeper life in deeper life when you're in a relationship, you tell the church the day you're going to go and see your wife to be, they will attach an elder. 
You will sit here. She will sit there. The elder will be in the middle, mediating. So you turn, you say to her, the elder is listening. Say, God bless you, sister. Say, God bless you, brother. How are you today? I am fine. So it is well with you as well. Let's go. Look, no matter how you police people around, Ajatio Sono, by interpretation, the dog that is determined to get lost, no matter how loud the hunter blows the whistle, it will not hear. Restrictions that are external and are not from within by the Holy Spirit can only restrain you for a period of time. That's the truth. So I went and hugged her. Don't cry. She will get saved. And one of the Pharisees that said Jesus was operating by the spirit of Beelzebub. I don't want to call his name because I still see him. Looked at me and said, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, I rebuke that spirit from you. On the crusade ground. And I began to weep. Because I didn't know they don't hug on crusade ground. I wasn't romancing her. I was sincerely comforting her. But I already been judged by my actions and not by my intentions. I can never forget. Because I was too naive as a Christian. I actually believed that the Holy Spirit had left me because a senior brother in the FCS rebuked the Holy Spirit. And it was my sister-in-law. Um, I'd known her then who would sit me down and tell me, the Holy Spirit is still in you. That's how easy it is to wreck somebody's life. can be so easy because if there was nobody there to reassure me I would have thought that I had lost the spirit of God that regenerated my spirit just because someone misinterpreted my actions watch what you say and what you think you saw. I can't forget that. Never. Because as a tender moment of my life, can't forget that. Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 18. I said I was going to give two examples. I gave one. If the other one comes back, God wants me to share it. Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 18. Whoever hides hatred has lying lips and whoever spreads slander is a fool give me the message translation liars secretly hoard hatred in them fools openly spread slander can we try another translation? New Living Translation or something? NLT. Hiding hatred makes you a liar. Slandering others make you a fool. 
So turn to your neighbor and say, Are you a liar or a fool? Which one? <laughs> Proverbs 11 verse 9. And what did they answer? This, this is serious business today. So that we will not partake of a table of hypocrisy. When we partake of the blood and partake of the bread, we can expect that we'll be thrust out there as overcomers. Because you must overcome accusation, but when you are the one who is uh, the ministry, who has taken on the ministry of accusation, then you are the one to be overcome. The hypocrite with his mouth does what? Destroys his neighbor. But through knowledge, the righteous will be delivered. Message translation again. The loose tongue of the godless spreads destruction. The common sense of the godly preserves them. Let's look at Galatians chapter 5 today. Let me say this to you. I know that this is the age when we are reminded to be vocal. Where we are told and instructed to express our opinion. But can I help you out that you should be careful <laughs> how you speak. Thank you, sir. I never liked... For certain reasons, let, let, me, let me be careful with my choice of words. And let's not say I never liked. I never believed in the previous administration of GEJ. I had no prejudices. I saw a lot of shortcomings. But I never called my president a fool. And I know people who did. Might have lacked competence. Jesus said, <laughs> if you call, how does it say it? Raka. Can we find that scripture? Matthew 5, I think it is. The young man say, my father, that old man is a fool. We're watching you. I know it should be Matthew chapter 5. Yeah, Matthew chapter 5, verse 22. Powerful scripture. I say to you that whoever is, okay, even if you don't believe any scripture in the Bible, this one is in red. Okay? You believe in Jesus, but Jesus said this one. So maybe you have been jumping the ones that are in black. This is in red. But I say to you, that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, that means fool, shall be in danger of the council. No, Raka, shall be, what does Raka mean here? Um, a curse. Curses his brother shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. is in red. 
You know when something is in red? <laughs> it's covered by the blood of Jesus. <laughs> no, it means... So when you call someone a fool that is made in the image of God, what are you saying? You say, but scripture calls some people fool. Let the scripture call them. Oh, foolish Galatians. I'm not the one who said it. Galatians 5 and verse 13. The same Galatian church. For you brethren have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. You know, but through love serve one another. Be careful about the liberty to speak. Oh yes, we're free. Let's talk. Let's say anything. We can talk. In the book of Jude, wish we had time. The Bible warns about those who are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. And when people are placed in authority, be careful what you say. Must bring balance to certain thoughts because you 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 know I, I constantly ask myself this question. This this is personal audit, you know, and I, I perform it all the time. Sometimes when people say, say, Pastor, your preaching is not working, I don't understand what's happening. It's not that they're not hearing the word, but there are certain things they're doing that short circuiting the grace and power of God in their lives, and it's not making them effective in what they do. Romans chapter 13 says, let every soul be subject unto higher authority. Means if you see a policeman doing his job and he, somehow he, and he, you're not happy with him and you say, idiot, fool, you may get away with it in the natural, but God in heaven hears you. You violated the order of heaven. That's why the Bible says, honor your father and your mother so that what will happen? Your days will be long upon the earth. This is the commandment with promise. Long life is guaranteed by honor to your father and your mother. Your father calls you, he says, this, this useless man is calling me. He wants to collect money again. Ah, uh, it's minus five years. <laughs> Maybe you are to live to 80. It's now 75. And your mother calls you, he says, this is a year woman. Minus five. Keep reducing it. Some people have met uncertain death, not because the devil killed them, but because they dishonored their parents. That's where there's room for repentance. Your father and your mother have rights over you even when you are 60 and they are 90. Don't say, don't disturb me. Say, I'm a man of my own now. Continue. I have good news for you. As long as your father is alive, is alive you are still a child. That's the truth. I mean, I sit with my dad sometimes. And sometimes I, I think he still thinks I'm 17. 
because I've seen his child. Can tell me the story of my life. And after we've had some discussion, then he say, "How old are you? How old are you, Seth?" <laughs> I tell him, "Say, really? You, wow, you are no longer a small child." But he has spoke. <laughs> oh God! You must learn to absorb it <laughs> and take it in. And that's exactly what happens when you become parents as well. And your children begin to. It's the same thing. That happens with you every time. <laughs> Who are you? I saw you come out. I bathed you. I paid your school fees. So now you are 40. And I'm talking to you, you are talking back. Do you know what Jacob said to Laban? He said, if it had not been for the fear of my father Isaac, ah, I would have reacted to this maltreatment too. Where was Isaac? Far away. Where was Jacob? He, in Laban's house. But the fear of his father was still guiding him. children must not lose their respect for their parents. No matter what your parents do. Several years ago, I was in Lagos. I'm, I'll take my time to deal, so uh, I'm in no hurry. Are you warning me? Because when you say, take your time. <laughs> huh? Okay, take as much time. Okay, I will. Yeah, somebody say, take your time. <laughs> you see, now you made me forget what I wanted to say. I was in Lagos. At Lateran Assembly. We went for classic. And that early morning, this was 20. Classic was September, this was 2011. I woke up in the morning, was at Excellence Hotel, and the Holy Spirit said to me, Strange utterance. If your father, commits murder and is incarcerated, does he stop being your father? And I said, no. If your father decides to marry three women, does he stop being your father? No. If your father rapes a girl under the age of 11, now there's a law. And is sentenced to life imprisonment according to the laws of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Does he stop being your father? No. You can't disfather your father. Neither can your father dis son or this daughter his son or daughter. Now, you may want to Stay away. But look, no matter how long you stay away, somebody's going to see you somewhere and say, Ah, come. Are you not? Is your father a debayo? And that will remind you that that father you claim you don't want to associate with. Should I finish the story? The last day of the classic, I shared with one of the leaders and I said, 
because the way he was going, I, I just wrote down that experience and I, and I shared it with him. And I said to him, this is what the Holy Spirit said to me this morning. And he said, you must share this for everybody to hear. I didn't know what this, where this was going or what it was going to uh, tie up. So I got up just at the closing of Classic and I said, uh, I woke up some days ago. I can't understand what this means. But I think as the service was going, I began to understand that there were going to be certain changes that were going to shake that fellowship of ministers. And I came and shared it. And everybody was blessed by it. Months later, it was when Pastor Bakri accepted to be VP for General Buhari. And those who heard it forgot that illustration and began to say all kinds of things against him in the pages of paper every week. In 2015, things have changed. The order has changed. And the same people now are trying to find how they can go and apologize if they had only listened. The problem with betrayal is this, that except the hearts of those who betray you are totally, and I don't know where I was giving this illustration, it was Lester Sumra who said this. He said, when people betray you and they repent, he said, accept them back. But you must know where to place them. So in every relationship, as an individual, you must have like three rings. If they were in the inner ring, don't quickly bring them back. Keep them on the outside. And when they prove themselves, you move them closer to the inner ring. Can I say something profound? In every single one of us, there is the seed of betrayal. That except you allow the Holy Spirit to, to, to kill it and is the one that rules your life. <laughs> Galatians 5. I'll soon be done. Galatians 5.13. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty only. Do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love do what? Serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word. Even in this, you shall love who? Your neighbor as yourself. Verse 15. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. Give me this in the, trans in the message translation. Because you don't bite. You bite with your mouth. Okay, whether it's physically or in other words. If you bite and ravage each other, watch out in no time at all. You'll be annihilating each other. And where will your precious freedom be then? You bite with your mouth. And continuous biting leads to what? D annihilation. Devouring. You create all kinds of chaotic situations and an atmosphere where all that governs is bring them down. It's called bring him down ministry. Bring her down ministry. 
that, that may be a good name for a ministry. Bring him down. PhD International Incorporated. Numbers chapter 12. You know, sometimes uh, it's as if some scriptures don't exist in the Bible. We need to bring things into balance. Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman he had married. Now, let me ask you an honest question. Was Moses wrong in marrying the Ethiopian woman? Yeah. Yes, because you were not to intermingle as a Jew with the heathen. Huh? Ethiopian women are very beautiful. They're not black, they're not white. Remember my first trip traveling to China through Addis. I mean... When I saw Ethiopian women, I knew that Solomon <laughs> could not have resisted the Queen of Sheba. I know that's the foundation of Rastafarianism. Heli Selassie is reported in quote, it's not in the Bible, but history says the last descendant of Solomon. And I've shared this story before, I think. Uh, it's reported that Solomon had an affair with the Queen of Sheba. She gave birth to a carbon copy of Solomon. When he was full grown, the Queen of Sheba sent the son of Solomon to go see his father. And the father decided, okay, you're going back to Ethiopia. I am king. Everything that is in Israel, I will replicate. Chariots. Even a replica of the ark. So all of that was given to him. And as he was returning back to Ethiopia, the Ethiopians thought it was Solomon coming back. Because all the regalia was like that of Solomon in, in Israel. And therefore, it is believed that the final resting place of the ark is in Ethiopia. Even till today. It's quite interesting when you look at the majority of the population of Christians in Ethiopia. And Ethiopian Jews. It, now, it's not in the Bible, so I can't substantiate it. Call it legend, call it history. But you get what I'm saying. Moses saw an Ethiopian babe. And he forgot what God had said and married her. Verse 2. And I'll show you something here. So they said. Now, you will find out the day later. Has the Lord in this spoken only? Is Moses the only prophet? Has the Lord in this spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. Now, let me look. It was a private conversation between Aaron and Miriam. They didn't come out to announce it and hold court and discuss. No, it's Miriam and Aaron. <laughs> Only the two. Miriam, you, you prophesied now. When we came out of Egypt, you took the tambourine. You also prophesied the word of the Lord. Hey, prophet, I, I, me, I'm a priest. Is he the only prophet? We are all anointed. Said, okay, let's, let's keep it low. And who heard? But well, look at what God anchored his judgment upon the character of Moses. 
Now the man Moses was very humble more than all men who were on the face of the earth. Suddenly the Lord said to Moses, Aaron and Miriam, come out you three to the tabernacle of the meeting. Let's have a meeting. So the three came out. Then the Lord came down in the pillar of cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam. Aaron and Miriam come out and they came forward. I'm sure maybe they thought now Moses will be deposed. Miriam will take over as prophet who will lead uh, prophetess. Then he said, hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house, but he married an Egyptian woman. against God's word and God said there's no one as faithful he must have shocked Miriam and Aaron now they are trembling I speak with him face to face even plainly and not in dark sayings and he sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? So the anger of the Lord was aroused against them and he departed. And when the cloud departed from above the tabernacle, suddenly Miriam looked at herself and she became leprous. As white as snow. Then Aaron turned towards Miriam and there she was, a leper. So Aaron said to Moses, Oh my Lord, please do not lay this sin on us in which we have done foolishly and in which we have sinned. Please do not let her be as one dead whose flesh is half consumed when it comes out of his mother's womb. Why didn't they go to the Lord to now say, Lord, please don't. God has introduced himself. I speak to Moses face to face. You better turn to Moses. So Moses cried out to the Lord saying, please heal her, O God, I pray. Then the Lord said to Moses, if her father had spit in her face, would she not be shamed seven days? Let her be shut out of the camp seven days and afterwards she may be received again. See, the only reason, what happened to Aaron? Was it not both of them that spoke? That's the danger. Because you might have a conversation to slander someone or to say something. The person, both of you contributed, one will escape, you'll be the one that will suffer the consequences. And you think God is not fair. But let me help you out. Why did Aaron escape it? By virtue of his position. Because the priest of God, remember that he's the one that is the high priest who must order things in the tabernacle. If he's leprous, God's people are destroyed. So God said, Aaron, you escaped. Miriam, you can't escape. So she's cut out for seven days. And after seven days, she's restored. So I ask you again. Was Moses wrong in marrying an Egyptian? Yes. yes. But God called him faithful. Some things are scary. Yes. Truly scary. The problem is that we don't know how God sees. And therefore we are prone to judge unrighteous judgments. One 
one of the things or reasons why we must be careful with words is that they're difficult to retrieve. If someone talks about honorable lazy to you, be rest assured that the person will talk about you to someone else. Is a rule of life. So while you are listening and you're saying, eh, really? Wow. I didn't know. I'm going to go somewhere else and say, he also said, and sometimes it will be made to appear as if you were the one that initiated it, and they are just repeating what you said. They tried. Let me give you a secret. If you ever have a tail bearer, and they exist, look, <laughs> this is a house that is going somewhere. We must become one and whole. If you ever have someone come to you and say, oh, I don't like what Pastor Ayo did. He did this. Just say, are you ready for me to call him so that you will say the same thing in his presence? And I am telling you, you will shut people down at the speed of light. Look. I'm trying to find word here. Not everybody is likable at first sight. I can tell you free of charge what some people have said about me. He's proud. Ah, yes. I look it. Uh, if you say so. So you are one of them. Okay, look. Okay. He's pompous. Oh, I've, he, he, yeah, it's sad. Uh, no, he's standoffish. And then they get close and say, uh -uh, okay, we misjudged him. Some do, some never do. And sometimes we have felt that about people too. You see someone, I remember when I first saw my wife, I didn't like her. There's a confidence in her walk I didn't like. <laughs> How can a woman be confident like that? And that's my own problem. <laughs> it's tradition. It's a mindset. But then you finally get to meet the person and then you realize, mm, it's not so. Ask your neighbor, are you prejudiced against someone? You did to her too. You didn't like her first time. She was eating from where? From pot, black pot. Why are you pinching him? Nah, this is church. Let the word of God, let the truth be spoken. The Bible says, say the truth and shame the devil. Where is that in the Bible? Very instructive. John chapter 7 verse 24. Do not judge. 
according to appearance, but judge how? Righteous judgment. So what is righteous judgment? The Holy Spirit is the only one who can grant you righteous judgment. Why shouldn't you judge according to appearances? I'll give you an example. They're deceptive. John chapter 4. It was wrong for a rabbi to be found speaking with a woman in public. It was a taboo. Watch. Jesus and his disciples are hungry. He sends them to the city to buy food. He's with the woman at the well of Samaria. Alone. They come back with food. Jesus said, I'm not hungry. I have my... <laughs> you, 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 I have food to eat that you don't know anything of. What's the next verse? The disciples said to another, did anybody bring him something to eat? Next verse. Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish it. And you are toasting a woman in public and you are a rabbi. They didn't know what conversation was going on. Give me the next verse. Do you not say there's still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they're already white. Why are you thinking I'm having a conversation with the woman? I'm looking at harvest. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this, the same is true. One sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you've not labored. Others have labored and you've entered into their labors. I'm looking for a verse of scripture that says, um, and none of them dared ask him. It's still further down. Many of the Samaritans of the city that they believe because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all that I ever did. Where is it? I can find it. Anyway, when they find it, they'll show it to you. <laughs> That's why it's good to use analog. And I'm using it, I know where it is. Um, none of the disciples dared ask him what he was doing with the woman. 27, it's earlier. Go back to 27. At this point, his disciples came and they marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet, no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking to her? It was inside them. There are pockets in people's minds and their spirits. They just said, let's keep it inside chamber. Or God, you go explain later. They had doubts in their mind. They were smart enough to keep it and watch to see if that's his nature or this was mission. I'm not sure you got that. Can I share something with you? My first valid fight with my pastor, valid fight, was in 2011. His friend, Pastor Banka Kimola in Atlanta, came to Nigeria. And when I'm in Atlanta, I go to Pastor Bank's church. So that relationship had been founded and we sat down and Pastor Bank was asking after one of his sons who 
had gone riot and was saying all kinds of slander and so on and so forth in the pages of, of the paper. And I said to him, the developments that have happened since the last time you saw him, because he needed to be in the know. Later he told me, he said, he had planned to go visit the man and he could have just gone in there not knowing what had transpired. Uh, who knows what he would have gotten himself in. So I was mentioning it to him and a pastor saw me and said, I'm trying to forget something. It looks like you're trying to make me remember. I said, I'm going to take you up on this. It is not a threat. It's a promise. And I said to him, I said, Pastor Bank <laughs> wanted, he, here were questions that are the reason. And he was going to get himself into trouble, except I told him, you know, just mentioned that there had been some issues. And he said, it is a threat. It is not a threat. It is a promise. And Pastor Bank said, Pastor, should I relax? And Mrs. B said, Pastor, should I cool down? So that evening, I went to meet him in the hotel room, went back to the hotel. And I went, I said, sir, which is unlike me, uh, me of before. I take those, those things hurt me a lot. But I went to him and I said, sir, you issued a promise and not a threat. Uh, so can we sit down now and let's talk about it? And he said to me, he said, I'm not ready to talk. Nobody can make me talk when I don't want to talk. Um, so you can go rest. And this is four years he's never spoken. Do you know why? Because even though it looked like something wrong, he wanted to find out, is this his character? Or this was just one situation that I misunderstood. It's quiet here. So the disciples kept quiet. So let's watch. Remember that what settled it for Moses was when the Bible or God began to speak about the character of Moses. Moses is called the meekest man on the face of the earth. You don't understand what it means. Meekness is an attitude that shows you your, your total submission um, to authority. Moses would plead for the children of Israel when God said, Moses, look, Moses, I will kill this generation. I will start a new generation with you. That must have sounded like, what? That's good. I would become the father of all generations. Oh, I mean, I've become the apex of the next generations coming. Moses said, Lord, let me tell you something. If not joke, may stop her. Because if you try it, the heathen will say, You brought them out, but you could not take them into the land of promise. That's to show you the kind of person he was. Somebody else has said, kill them all. All by fire, by thunder, rebellious people. Die, die, die. By fire. This looks like a good place for us. To begin to break bread. The bread of love. The bread of sincerity. The bread of honesty. The bread of unity. The bread of oneness. And by breaking, thank you, the bread of repentance. And by breaking bread, we are saying to one another, that we will operate by the rule and the law of love. Because love does not take 
an account of a suffered wrong. Even when people hurt you, you let it go. The things I say here that makes me sound stupid. And I know what's in the mind of people. They say, well, it's because he has. I would never struggle with someone over money. You can't hear somebody on the face of the earth say, I cheated them. And I've been cheated. Years ago, I gave a young man, when I was in Kaduna, a car to sell. Sold it, diverted the money, chopped it. That was like nine years ago. The question is, where is he in his life now? And where am I? He sold the car for 600000 Am I crying? I say, oh God, that money would have made a difference in my life. Has God not prospered me beyond that point? But where is he? When people are trying to struggle in the, you must rise above them. But it's difficult to rise above them if you don't see yourself above them. If you can't see a future, if you can't see where God is taking you, you'll be getting into fights over 200 naira, 2,000 naira. I give him my money, give me my money. Yeah, oh God. I gave you my money, you don't want to pay me back. Bye bye. Take it as yours. I keep saying that relationship is the currency of the spirit. You never know who you're going to need and who you, whose door you're going to knock on. I remember a friend who offended me and later would become, and I shared it at the program we went for, later would become an instrument of blessing to me. Uh, wrote me a check of 20 million naira and said, you forget it, you don't have to pay back. That's a relationship that could have gone sour. He really could have and I would have been vindicated by it. It's quite interesting. I recently became the chairman of a bank and he needed help. And God positioned me to be the only instrument that can help him. don't know how God intends our paths to cross. But when you've used your mouth to destroy certain people and God says that's the door you must knock through or knock at to go through, how do you knock? Let's stand on our feet. I need you wherever you are to pray. And if there's anything you need to ask for, it's to ask for God's mercy. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16 says, We should come boldly to the throne of grace. That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. It is called the throne of grace, but from the throne of grace proceeds mercy. This is an opportunity for you to repent for everyone. Oh, you've used your mouth to function in the ministry of accusation, of slander, of gossip and carrying all kinds of malicious stories. Now, some stories may even be valid and true. May even be confirmed. But the fact that you became a vehicle to propagate it is what you need to repent of. Can we lift up our voices?
If you want to kneel, you can kneel. If you want to just lift up your hands and ask him for forgiveness. This is the one who said, upon this rock, I will build my church. He is going to build his church and we must not become tools in the hands of the devil that would use that would be used to destroy what he is building i will build my church the gates of hell shall not prevail against it the accuser of the brethren must be overcome we overcome him by the blood of the lamb we remind him of calvary that's why jesus said these do in remembrance of me the calvary finished it all calvary settled it all calvary gave us victory and except we stop being tools in the hands of the accuser we cannot overcome because the blood is to overcome the accuser and if we are the accusers then it means that we also will be overcome but yet he's called us to be overcomers for every word of slander maya kalaba shadaya lebrege du sakaya bashata likreke dos kalaba haya lebrege du kalaba haya for speaking evil of dignities yekele boshanda yanga la brege dos kalaba haya have mercy lord maya kalaba shataya for being an instrument of gossip maya kalaba shadaya lebrege du skaya bahaya for venting hatred out of your mouth for lying lips for malicious talk maya kalabashandaya have mercy lord lebakashadaya we repent as a church ya kalabashande lebrogodos kelibege lebrogodoya for stepping out of your word and your law of love there's a song that says create in me create in me a clean heart oh god and renew a right spirit within me create in me create in me a clean And renew us with spirit. Cast me not away from your presence. can go to the Lord's table knowing that we would love one another that we will protect one another 
for one of the things about love is that love has a confrontational dimension as well that we will speak to one another in love and we will confront one another in love if a man has ought against his brother he goes to him one on one doesn't spread it around first one on one and he says let's lock ourselves in and let's sort this thing out between you and i and once it's settled it doesn't go between the two of us and many times damage is done because the whole world knows before you even try to sort out the issue and when you've sorted the issue out the whole world that knew that there was an issue does not know that the issue has been sorted out so words that I've spoken continue to hurt and continue to wound continue to pierce and we continue to, to shoot arrows as archers to wound people never forget the words of Kenneth Hagin powerful words great man inspired me greatly he said putting out somebody else's candle does not lighten your own never does you see someone's light shining bright and you think oh why is he the one always getting the advantage gaining great strides you try to quench his light by using malicious words it won't lighten your own you will still be in darkness you would even be in deeper darkness helping with the communion the night in which he was to be betrayed it amazes you that he was going to be betrayed by his own and yet he still broke bread with them remember I said this that Jesus was not only betrayed by Judas he was also betrayed by Peter. Judas sold him. And I think at the back of the mind of Judas, he thought, look, this guy can never die. I mean, I've watched him. The power of God is upon his life. I'll make some quick money of him when they crucified him he couldn't handle it anymore and he hung himself as Judas three times Peter was asked do you know him he said lie lie I don't work with this kind of people or with this kind of man the cock crowed Jesus turned back to look at Peter to say I told you you would but even with that you still find grace so when he rose up from the grave because Peter was so badly beaten don't eat the bread yet if you've received it we'll eat it together that's what unity is all about the Bible says when you come together to break the bread of, of fellowship and communion there is one eats before the other that's not right that's not in order that's what Paul was speaking to the Corinthian church so let every man give the other preference. Do you know what it means to give your brother preference? Do you know what it means? Do you know what it means? We're not here to live and practice and live like a dog eat dog world. Not at all. We must prefer one another in love in so many ways think about this you go to a car lot to buy a car you meet someone from lighthouse there who wants the same car both of you want that car because it's good the price is cheap who will let go of the car for the other you prefer one another in love the one who truly loves will say look 
as much as this is the car I love and I can't get anyone this cheap, I would prefer you. That's the one that wins at the end. The one who buys the car is the one that loses. And then watch what would happen when God would provide a better car for the person who preferred his brother in love. Our fights should be more about preferring one another. Where there will only be one seat and there are two people and you will say, no, you sit, you sit, you sit. And we keep saying it until nobody can sit. That's a good fight to have. Or we both decide you sit on half, I sit on the other half. Has everybody been given? You took bread? Has everyone received at the back? Okay, there's still people out there. took the bread and broke it and he gave to them gave to them said take and eat this is my body broken for you it's broken so that yours will not be broken it's broken so that you will not have broken fellowship with God God that you will not have broken fellowship with man. Keep the bonds of love and of unity strong, ever, ever, ever strong. And as long as we belong to the same house and to the same church, we must love one another with fervent love. Nobody can say I am as perfect as Jesus. But we're all striving towards perfection. So yes, we would have issues of friction one with another. Sometimes someone may say a careless word that may hurt you. But you must, in spite of what may be said, in spite of what may be said in a tone that you don't like. Sometimes our challenge is with the tone by which that is used when things are said. You must be able to walk and move beyond it and say you're my brother, you're my sister. I forgive you. I release you. Father, we thank you for the bread of love, sincerity, honesty, unity, perfection, oneness that we have. You said, behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. It is as the oil that was poured upon the head of Aaron that flowed to his garments. Father, I pray that there would be in an ushering in of a new dimension of grace in this house today. That Father, every uh, attempt of the enemy to limit your people is destroyed forever today in the name of Jesus. That Father, today we begin to overcome come and walk in the reality of overcomers in the name of Jesus we overcome the accuser of the brethren we overcome every accusation we overcome every slander we overcome every sin we overcome every fault we overcome every defect in our lives and in this church in the name of Jesus take and eat this is his body broken for you in Jesus name the presence of the Lord is in this place